officially kicks out. Remember we talked about the garrison that the Greeks put up in, in Jerusalem, the Akra, and so he officially, he finally kicked them out and declared independence. So officially, the Jews received political independence with the uh, assumption of the, of the throne by Simon. No, Hanukkah is 164. Hanukkah is a long time ago. Hanukkah is 164 BC. This is three years after the original uh, institution of all these religious bands. Okay, so three years later, he purified the temple. And, and uh, 141, is, uh, 141 is political independence. Hanukkah is religious. Yeah. Hanukkah is religious. But then political independence wasn't fully achieved until, until three decades later. So one, the first time one forty. Yeah. Thing. Yes. One, the first in four hundred fifty years. Finally, one forty one BC. One forty one BC. No Muslims. No Muslims. No. What is Hanukkah? You said one forty one. What was it called? Um, it wasn't really called anything. He just called himself king. Judea. It was called Judea. It wasn't called Israel. It was called Judea. It was a kingdom. Yeah. The kingdom of Judea. Yeah. I say Judea because in, in, in Latin, the Romans called it Judea. So that's the official name. Israel belongs to the Jews? The term Israel doesn't really apply here because Israel connotes a federation of 10, 11, 12 tribes. So yeah, so Judea, after the exile, only one tribe returned. So we don't call it Israel, we call it Judeans. <coughs>
Okay, they didn't control a lot of territory, they didn't have a lot of population, but it was pure. They worshipped Yahweh only, and there were very strict rules, everyone conformed. If you didn't conform, you were not part of the system. You can do whatever you want, but don't call yourself a Jew. After, we're talking about after the turn now. After the turn, you had several hundred people in the beginning. Later it grew to several thousand. Okay, in the beginning they only controlled Jerusalem and the immediate vicinity, and, and they're basically the province grew. They grew and grew and grew. So and what do you mean through the uh, Israel, those beginning Jews, there were no other types of people or religions there? Not, not in Jerusalem. Yeah. Jerusalem was a single religion city. Only Yahweh. And Jews. Only yeah. Jews. Jews. Jerusalem was very Jewish. <coughs> The, the you mean around during, during the rebuilding of the second yes. temple, this was okay. already now. Yes. Really the surrounding area of Jerusalem, uh, around Jerusalem, is a whole entire different ball game. If you go to Samaria, obviously Samaria wasn't part of Judean territory. It was, uh, it was not part of the, of the Judean province, uh, the Persian province of Judea, and uh, and it didn't become affiliated with with uh, with the Jewish system until many years later, which which I'm going to get to right now, which is that after the launching of the new city-state, now they launched on, on a new campaign of expanding the borders. So now you have this, every succeeding uh, Hasmonean monarch, after Simon, including starting with Simon himself, is essentially expanding the territory more and more and more. So well, first, to spread the religion? Um, good question. Probably it was multifactored. It was both religious, and, in other words, the religious element might have been drawn on ideological notions of, of this is the land that was promised to us by God. So that might have been one, one drive uh, uh, for these military campaigns. The other would have been economical. Because if you control the coastland, right, if you control a city like Yakko or Gaza, then you're controlling the maritime trade. So that brings in a lot of income. Who are they fighting against this territory? Who was living there? I mean, who are they fighting for Chalami? No, they're not fighting any organized army at this, at this point. They were spreading, right? Some, they it's, were a, it's officially under the Seleucid control, but obviously the Seleucids are weak right now, and they're, and, the, and, and, the, and they're running rampant, and the Seleucids can't control them. So yes, at the expense of the Seleucids, the, 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 the Maccabees expanded their, their state. Their what, year is, what year is this? 120? This is between 140 and, one, and, and 70 BC. So for the next 50, 60, 70 years, they're progressively expanding their territory more and more and more. And it's almost phenomenal the way, I mean, they're not just doubled it, they tripled, quadrupled, quintupled. I mean, it's, it's huge. Like the Jewish Renaissance. Yeah. It, it, was it was major. bigger than Israel is now. Yes, correct. It was bigger than Israel is now. And it was bigger than, in some ways, it at least reached what presumably, what, what allegedly was the Davidic borders of Israel. According to the Bible, during the period of David and Solomon, this was like the greatest, uh, um, the peak of Israel's political power. And so they controlled the, the Gilead and, and God, all those territories. The Romans were okay with it. The Romans were not on the scene yet, just yet. This is between the Greeks and the Romans. The Romans Herod, Herod, Herod brought the Romans in. Right, Herod is later. Herod, Herod is after, after 37. Herod, come to, Herod, Herod came to power in 37 BCE. But the Romans first entered Jerusalem in 66 BC, right? Something like that, 66. So before 66 BC, the Romans did not exercise direct control, direct influence over Judea and over the Hasmonean monarchy. Indirect, they did, like I mentioned earlier, that some of the legitimacy of this whole campaign was bolstered, was augmented by the Roman presence. In other words, the mere fact that the Romans are around to provide a check against the Seleucids was enough to give them a sense of security that in case something bad happens, they can always call on Rome. They never quite did, but but that's, you know. They never quite did. I mean, the Romans didn't actually help the Maccabees. Yeah, they was a backup idea, and, and it gave them moral support. It was more, the moral support is, I think, the most important thing. Wasn't there a period of Syrian occupation Syrian or Assyrian? Assyrian? That's way earlier. Assyrian is during the first half of the first temple. Who destroyed the first temple? The Babylonians. So it's Assyrians, and then, and then after the Assyrians, you have the, uh, uh, what am I missing here? The Assyrians, the Babylonians. 
Babylonians, yeah. The Babylonians the defeated the Assyrians, right? The two kings. Yeah. First, first the Assyrians. Uh, yeah, the Babylonians, right? 612 BC. 612 BC is when is when they finally Nineveh was conquered by the Babylonians. 612 BC, if I remember correctly. So yeah, the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians, and yeah, so the Assyrians is, is those the Assyrians are history at that point. Nobody even knows who they are. Are they connected to the Assyrians? Um, indirectly, yes. Yeah. Indirectly, but it's not. There was no direct connection. The, the state of Syria, the Greek state of Syria, is so called because it was at once part of the Assyrian Empire. But it's indirect. There was another period of the loss of the period the Syrian culture is The what? Was in that period of the Syrian Assyrian, 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 yeah. Was there an adaptation by Jewish people of the Syrian culture? Uh, you know, an adoption of Assyrian culture by the by the Israelites, you say? Uh, I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of that, but it's certainly beyond the scope. Of the okay. So, you guys want to adjourn, or you want to? Yeah, I just want to say one thing. Yes. See, I have to get this out. See, I disagree with you on one point, though. And this is now the building of the Second Temple period. Right? So he, the, he was aware that the Jews at the time weren't, they didn't know the laws, God's laws. So he re, he gives the laws to people, right. like almost like a second of Moses. So what I'm getting at, my question is, if that's true, then wouldn't it also make sense on some level that the development of the one God the Yahweh would also still possibly be an evolution at this time? Meaning that at the time of Ezra, you're saying at the beginning people still would have worshipped more than one God? That's what you're suggesting? Yes. I'm not aware, like I said, I'm not you're aware. Not aware of I've studied the his history of Israel, of Judea, of, of, I'm not aware of people worshipping more than one God in the times of Ezra. Okay. Hey, Really? Yeah, I was quite sure. Okay. It's just a, it's a fascinating time. Yeah. This time. Right. This developmental right. time. And so. That you know, refers to literacy. There was a total lack of literacy among the people. And then it also refers to the fact that you have a lot of people outside Jerusalem. And you have no real means of communication or transportation. Right? So they're pretty much doing what they always had done. And that's why it's no and maybe the other thing, the other, right. and the other, the other factor that confused things a little is the fact that the Babylonians had just returned from exile. So the Babylonians, while they were in exile, they did not intermarry. They remained separate. They maintained their religion and their identity. So the people, the Babylonians, returned from exile especially the aristocracy, they were careful to preserve their heritage. Now, oh, I see. You mean the deeply religious is right. returned to Jerusalem. Right. They were, they were okay. definitely pure. So maybe purists. there were different Now, on, on the lower levels of society, the peasants, you know, they don't know anything. They, don't, they, don't, they can't read or write. They don't know what's happening. What? In numbers, maybe so, but not greater than influence, though. When you talk about culture and Jewish heritage, they wouldn't have exerted as much influence on the shape of the, of the Jewish uh, culture. And so these people essentially, they were made to comply or either leave the cult. You couldn't remain, you couldn't, you couldn't remain a Jew. You couldn't basically give them a and lose that benefit from the services that's offered, while at the same time, not to support In that case, you weren't a Jew. In that case, you were not But ultimately, what kept these people together? Right? Right. Right. But ultimately, a person like that would have been assimilated, unless they, at the very least, made a pilgrimage three times a year, or one, or one thing, I don't know. They, somehow, they accepted the hegemony of the aristocracy. If not, then what makes you a Jew? If you put the answer to this, what makes you a Jew? You know, these people would have been assimilated. Yeah.
Did, did you make your point? Yeah. Did you get to the conclusion of where you? I did, and I have a lot of more material, but I've talked for a while, so I think I'm going to open the floor for questions. What is, what's there a point that you were trying to? I was trying to talk yeah. about the Hellenism and the Hasmoneans and how they interacted, and uh, I was also trying to show that um, that the early Hasmoneans actually stemmed from a Hellenistic culture. And even, like I said, like, they had like, like, names, like pointed out earlier. And um, so we see that. And um, yeah, that's, that's what I've covered so far. There's a lot of other materials that I can go on about. Was there something to think that you would you know, one to walk away with? Um, I want you to walk away with, I think what I what I uh, aroused most people's attention most, I think, was the what was it? The, uh, oh, my oh, the afterlife, right? The Pharisees versus the Sadducees. Right? I made a punch the differences punch between the, the, Pharisees and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I think that's what uh, I, I guess that's the most important thing to lecture today would be why, first of all, what the actual differences in their philosophy were, and secondly, why? What were the material conditions that prompted them to diverge in this regard? Why somebody would believe in the afterlife? would believe in the resurrection, would believe in divine reward and punishment in the future, whereas a different sect would have. And, uh, yeah, so let me finish with, uh, with, uh, um, with Joseph. Yes, in part. As we, yeah, as we discussed earlier, in part it was economical, but the people from the lower classes who had the have-nots, right, who didn't, basically they toiled and toiled, and they didn't see any future in store for them, so for them, it just didn't make any sense. Theotically, if that's a word, from the point of theodicy, justifying God, like if God is around, God is real, and if God is to be worshipped, then how are things right if I work so hard and I do the right thing, and still, yet, I get nothing in return. So the only alternative, the only solution is, there is an afterlife. How about anti-Semitism? Is there any relationship to... Anti-Semitism is related to... Uh, we didn't get to that point. Since you asked, I'll mention it, which is that after one of the Hasmonean rulers was John Hercanus. Who? Uh, John Hercanus. Okay, John Hercanus ruled for 30 years, approximately between 130 and 100 BC. So he, one of the things he did was forcibly convert other religions, other people. He conquered territory and he converted them to Judaism. So some scholars believe that anti-Semitism was at least in part ori uh, originated from this phenomenon where you have people who see Judaism as an aggressive religion who is forcing people to accept their religion. And John that, Perkins started that? So it could have and, and, and remember, oh, uh, John Perkins, yes. And, and remember that these people that he, that he conquered and, uh, and subjugated were Hellenistic people. So he was so, doing the so Hellenistic have, bit to them, he was doing it back. Right. Uh, it's kind of like so now you have abuse, the Hellenistic abused kid using his own kids, kind right. of bringing this whole but, kind of... But it also makes the connection between the Roman and between the later anti-Semitism mm -hmm. and the origination of anti-Semitism, because it started out with the Greeks seeing the Jews as overstepping their authority, so to speak. Right. Like, you want to have your own religious independence? Okay, I'll grant you that. But when you start doing, committing violence against other people and, and trying to force your, what they thought, remember, they, they consider Judaism a primitive religion, right? So when you're forcing your primitive ideas onto other people, okay, now we gotta put a stop to that. What that's, that again? John Hercules converted the Dumians. Uh, approximately 110 BC, 115, I don't know the exact year. I would like to add something that, that a, a Sicilian told me, which is that the, the Mediterranean Sea was originally called the Sumerian Sea. And then anybody who lived along the Sumerian Sea had a lot in common to say, never knew when they were going to be attacked. And anybody who lived along the Sumerian Sea was Semitic. 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 You're trying to make a connection between Sumerian and Semitic? The, right. That's what, the, that's what his point was, connection. Also, the, the reason they had strong family ties is because they never knew when they were going to be attacked. Uh, so they had to have the With all the respect, out. Semitic and Sumerian have nothing to do with another. The word Semitic comes from Shem. Shem, Ham, and Yefet. So Semitic is, is a term that uh, uh, conjures up the Bible, right? the tradition, the biblical 
description of the genealogical description of, of how people descended from after the flood, etc. And it has nothing. The Samaria is based on Shomron. No, you're talking about the sea. The sea. Yeah, but the, if the, the sea is named after Shomron, you say it was the Samarian Sea, is it? Right, right. So if, if it was called the Samarian Sea, I don't know where it was called that way, but if that's the case, and it's named after Samaria, the city of Shomron, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just repeating what someone told me. No, no, I understand, but I'm just saying you should scrutinize this closer because, like right, I said, right, right, the Semitic and Samarian are two different things altogether. I, they sound similar. But like I said, no, but S A and S E, they're not that close. Yeah, two different vowels. Semitic and Samarian. When I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. Sorry. Jews Right. Because the Greeks are not Semites. So the Greeks. The Greeks, when the Greeks are launching any campaign against Jewish people, it would be called technically it's anti-Semitism because it's against the Semites, it's against Easterners, right? People from the Mesopotamia. Any, anyone living in the ancient Near East would be considered a Semite. But the Greeks would consider the Persian Semites also, the Persians, the Arabs, all of these people are all bunched together. But as far as but the, first, the term first originated with the Jews because the Jews are the first people to uh, to come into contact in, 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 in such a confrontational way with the Greeks. So, <coughs> yeah, I know. So, so the hypocrites say, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, the deal is that the Greeks can do it, but the Jews can't. <laughs> Exactly, and that's the question I ask. Why? Why? Because Greek culture is superior, and that's why. Might makes right. <laughs> so, exactly. So, so where might makes right. Might makes right. right. So where are the chosen Unlike people Arthur come says. from? The Jews have chosen people. Where did that come from? The chosen people concept is, is, in, the, is in the Bible. It says, uh, what does it say there? I forgot the, the quote. I chose you as a nation. It's, it's, it's all the it's, it's in the Old Testament everywhere. I'm curious about your impressions. Like, if you can take some of this out of the historical and make it contemporary, we have zealots today, clearly, right? We have people that you could consider mostly aligned with Hellenism. And I'm wondering if there's any energy that you see that's more aligned with. What's what you use? Aligned with what? With Hellenism, oh, Hellenism right. right? Assimilation, the, the dominant culture of the West. I, I think there's some socioeconomic parameters that may be shifted in your talk a little bit, right? So I'm just asking if you could put the historical aside a minute and bring your impressions to the contemporary. Sure, I actually wasn't uh, expecting to talk about this, but let's see. Um, how that applies to that nowadays? I guess I would say that, uh, first of all, we touched on the ability to, on one way, adopt culture, but at the same time, preserve it with the So I think we see that happening nowadays, to a very great extent. You have, how so? Well, nowadays you have a resurgence of modern orthodoxy, adopting old traditions and becoming more identified. They put on the yarmulke, they, they, uh, they adopt a lot of things. Like the modern orthodoxy core used to be extremely small 50 years ago, and they're growing. And they're, co they're coming to terms with, with, the, with the acceptance of an modern America of the notion that you can be an American and a minority at the same time. You don't have to conform, you don't have to adopt the mainstream culture in order to be an American. And, and this is true not just in Judaism, it's also true in other subcultures. Okay? It's also true with the Hispanics, it's true with the black people, and with many other ethnic groups in America. Right? They, we don't expect them, for example, we don't even expect them to stop speaking their language anymore. Right? Nowadays, all governments provide uh, translations in all their forms, and um, no bilingual, yeah, bilingual, bilingualism, so all that. So this is, uh, this is a repeat of, of this notion that you can adopt Hellenism and at the same time remaining religious. Um, yeah, like that period of time when, you know, say like the original period of anti-Semitism when uh, the Jews were forcibly converting people. Do you think that's one reason why there's this kind of prohibition against conversion up to the modern day? 
I don't think it's directly related to that. Uh, the religious freedom is a, is a notion that started with the Enlightenment. No, no, no. I'm talking about Jews not converting. Not oh, converting that. Other people into Jews. Jews not converting. Oh. Okay. Jews not. Yeah. Right. Uh, Jews, right. Jews, Jews not converting. No missionaries. What? No, no proselytizing. No proselytizing. No the no, yeah. yeah. The no That's proselytizing right. rule started during the Christian era. It started in the Christian area, and it's in response to the fact that they couldn't, they were not allowed to proselytize, because if they would, the Christian backlash would be severe. So they, they really couldn't do that. So after the Christian, that's what the Talmud was originally mentioned, it's not mentioned in the mission. It's certainly not uh, as far as, it certainly didn't exist during the Osmanian, the Osmanian period, as we have discussed. So, so during the Second Temple period, proselytizing was, was welcome. If you wanted to join, sure, please be my guest. Accept the God of Yahweh and and, uh, and you're welcome into the fold. No, after the Christian period, yeah, uh, after Justinian, who's the one who outlawed uh, Judaism? I mean, who accepted Christianity and started persecuting? I forgot the name. I think it was Justinian? Constantine, thank you. What year was that? It was the fourth century. It was the fourth century. I think it was 330, something like that. So 330, I think, is the, is the, is the dividing line here between proselytization and not. Before 330, the official policy of Rome is be a Jew, but don't be a Christian. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Christians were considered um, heretical, like, what, what are you guys up for? They, they were church, yeah, they were considered anti-Roman because they were, first of all, they were considered um, oh, that's less they predictable, were less, less yeah. rational, you know, well, they were how did the Jews get to settle in Syria? Oh, that's yeah. Okay, that happened at like 40 Can you speak loud, please? When? Okay, he asked the question how did Jews come to settle in Syria? Right. Okay, so, um, um, I have to answer that in two phases. First of all, how did Jews come to settle in Greek areas? Okay, that happened during the Second Temple period still. Okay? Because the Jews were not necessarily, um, they didn't always have the material, um, or material world, material culture that they needed. Like I said, Jerusalem was a poor they didn't have anything to be desired. And so sometimes they would leave, they would go to Alexandria, they had, for example, they had a temple in Elephantine, right, there was a temple there. Uh, um, Jewish temple? Jewish temple. The Jewish temple that was present in Elephantine. Where is Elephantine? Sacrificed to Yahweh. You want to say that? Um, related to this? Or? Yeah. Okay. Elephantine is needed something. So there was a Jewish temple that was there for 100, 200 years, I don't remember exactly how long, and eventually it was destroyed, I don't remember the circumstances. Do you know? Do you know anything about it? But there's a Jewish temple there. Why was the Jewish temple there? Because, the, the, why not? Egypt is a wonderful country. Egypt, you, you don't have any, any uh, famine in Egypt. You live in Judea, you get a famine every few years. In Egypt, you have the Nile. So why live in, if you can worship Yahweh in Egypt, Okay, notwithstanding the fact that the Torah doesn't uh, condone that, but if you can do it and get away with it, then, then yeah, why, why do it in Judea? You can do it in, in Egypt. And so the same thing would apply, to answer your question, the same thing would apply to other territories. Okay, you have the Greek culture, the culture was ascendant, it was strong, it was materially uh, strong, powerful, and, and prosperous, and so they would move out of Judea proper while maintaining the Jewish religion and identity. So these people would visit from time to time, but they would retain their Jewish commitment, their Jewish identity. This is during the Second Temple period. Now, fast forward, during the Second Temple period, it's anything before 60 AD. 60 AD is when the Second Temple was destroyed. 586 to 70, or 60. So it wasn't that BC. No, I'm sorry, you're right, it's 70. Yeah, right? 586 to 70. 78. 78. The Crusades is, is 1,000 AD. Thousand years later. To bring it to the present again, but on a unrelated note, can you say something about your tours of Williamsburg? Oh, my tours of Williamsburg. My yeah. tours of Williamsburg, the, the uh, commercial again. Okay. <laughs> Not a commercial. <laughs> so the tours of Williamsburg is designed to familiarize Jews with uh, several things. First of all, the development of the neighborhood, Williamsburg. It's a very unique, uh, it's, 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 it's the a cultural gem. Yeah. 
not just from the Jewish perspective, just as, as, as one of the original cities in Brooklyn, and the oldest, one of the oldest areas to be settled in New York, yeah, you'll see New York yeah. City. Yeah, very so it used to be a city unto itself. It used to be a Williamsburg city. So, so yeah, so one of the things that we tackle is the, the city, Williamsburg as a city, as a neighbor, and the other thing we discuss is Jewish immigration, Jewish culture. Okay, there's a lot of representation of that in Williamsburg. You have one of the earliest reform synagogues, temples, I should say, in New York City, and especially in Long Island, was was is present. It still still stands actually in Williamsburg. Is what street is it on? What's it called? It's called the Keep Temple, the Keep Street Temple. That's what, what, what is, is it? it uh, it's still uh, still standing. Yes. It, is it a uh, congregation? No. <laughs> the building still stands. It's a museum. What are people doing? The it's, it's used by the Hasidim. What street is it on? Keep Street. And so that's, yeah, so, so we discussed that, we discussed the, the major Russian-Polish like, immigration wave between 1880 and 1924, uh, and they used Williamsburg as a, as, a, uh, as a passing station between Greenhorn land and, and assimilation. How much do you charge? Uh, 38. $38. Do you have a Even in it? On I do. I said it WilliamsburgTour.com. Nice. Even tree grows in Brooklyn, I think, is partly. And we uh, include, uh, I mean, put a break in the middle. 